Must we obey the law? This is part three of our examination, in which we will consider the positions of both Hart and Dworkin. Now recall that our last video ended with John Austin. Now according to John Austin, law is the command of an uncommanded commander, or a legally unlimited sovereign who imposes duties and obligations on individuals. Now what Austin meant by this is that coercive power, coercion, is at the heart of law. What he means is that the threat of sanction is what in fact distinguishes law from non-law. Now this is where our examination of Hart begins. Hart was a British philosopher and professor of jurisprudence. Hart was not particularly concerned with a prescriptive theory of law. This is how a law can or should work but a descriptive theory of law. This is how law does work. He challenged Austin's representation of law, specifically as a tool of coercion, on two grounds. The first, the division Austin implies between the commander and the commanded is not as straightforward as Austin suggests. Parliament, for instance. Well, Parliament makes laws. They make these laws, and these laws will apply to members of the public, to the citizenry, but these laws equally apply to Parliament itself, to the lawmakers. Parliamentarians, for instance, pay taxes just like everyone else. The process is not as haphazard or as arbitrary as Austin suggests. Second, rather than solely impose duties or obligations, laws will frequently confer power and privilege. What this simply means is that not all laws will coerce us into doing something. Take, for example, the right to free speech. The right to free speech doesn't require us to speak, nor does it prohibit us from speaking. It provides us with the freedom to do so if we so choose. So as Hart ultimately put it, brute force alone does not make for law. Hart's understanding of the relationship between law, coercion, and morality thus appears more nuanced. To Hart, it's not simply a choice between coercive orders or moral commands. This false binary imposes an equally false appearance of uniformity between laws and social functions. What he means is that laws will ultimately serve a variety of purposes. Some laws, for instance, are commands, requirement to wear seatbelts. Some laws are moral, the prohibition of a romantic sexual relationship between an adult and a child. Some laws are administrative, birth certificates. Some laws are opportunistic, pay hikes for MPs during a recession. Laws punish, laws reward, laws organize contracts, laws establish courts, laws clarify how laws are to be enacted, amended, abrogated. Laws can be coercive, laws can be suggestive. Laws can simply be or simply amount to happy or unhappy accidents. Since law serves so many roles, Hart believes Austin is mistaken in suggesting that obedience is the foundation of a legal system. To Hart, it's more a matter of acceptance. So while laws possess a variety of characteristics, Hart largely distinguishes between two types of laws. There are the primary rules of obligation, and the secondary rules of obligation. Primary rules of obligation are the rules that regulate behavior directly. Citizens are bound by these rules, not because the state will punish them if they do not comply, as Austin claims, but because citizens will consent to being bound by the law. You can just ask yourself, do you feel obligated to follow the rules of the road? If so, why? The answer for most people is yes, they do feel obligated. 
And while the reasons may vary slightly, most people refrain from speeding. They stop at red lights, they give pedestrians the right of way, not because they're afraid of being punished, but because they accept that this is a sensible way of regulating driving. So we believe that following the rules of the road is ultimately the right thing for us and for others. We therefore accept our duty to obey the law. The flip side to the public's consent to the primary rules of obligation are the secondary rules of obligation. These are the lawmaking rules that public officials accept. So in this way, a law is valid if there is a procedure that can be used to identify how the law was enacted and whether it followed the correct procedures. If we can identify that, then the law will be valid. Hart's breakdown between primary and secondary rules of obligation simply means that public officials are bound by two levels of law. The substantive laws they pass and the lawmaking procedures that give their laws validity. According to Hart, to enjoy a fully formed legal system, both primary and secondary rules of obligation must be in effect. When it comes to morality, Hart also disputes the central precepts of natural law. Moral and legal rules may overlap, just as legal rights may exist without any moral basis. To Hart, legality is never determined by morality, but by social practice. The way he sees it, if a judge must resort to morality to issue a ruling, the content of law becomes arbitrary as we require more than social facts to figure it out. Think of it this way. If morality is the basis of law, whose morality is the judge to apply when resolving a conflict? Their own, that of the parties, the lawyers, or perhaps the government that appointed them. Unlike law, which is contained in a statute or a judgment, morality is difficult to pinpoint. A citizen must be capable of distinguishing between the demands of their conscience and the demands of the state. It is at this point that Dworkin joins the conversation. Dworkin held what many regarded as opposing views to those of Hart, largely because of his sustained criticism of legal positivism. The following statement perhaps best captures Dworkin's theory of law. The nature of legal arguments lies in the best moral interpretation of existing legal practices. As we can see, morality not only precedes law, but is the lens through which law is understood. The basis of Dworkin's morality is that of equal rights, which he believes all humans are owed by the mere virtue of their humanity. So in line with the liberal basis of Dworkin's theory is the state's role as protector of personal autonomy. Central to Dworkin's theory of law is the distinction between description, between interpretation, and between normativity. Description is rather straightforward. We can describe chairs or tables or cars. We can describe the weather or a person or an animal. Description is primarily observation. A description tells us little more than what we observe. Normativity, however, has a different purpose. Normativity tells us what is right and tells us what is wrong. It tells us what we should have done or what we ought to do. It tells us who to praise and ultimately who to condemn. For example, the statement, we should all go vegetarian, or we should all vote green, or we should all practice X religion are all normative statements. In terms of law, normativity is expressed as a conclusion. In terms of law, normativity is expressed as a conclusion or a judgment about our acts and those of others. Interpretation is distinct from description and normativity, though it requires both of them. What Dworkin argues is that some concepts can only be understood 
in an interpretive way. A simple description will tell us little and needs to be invested with some meaning if we are to act. The same goes for normativity, which references a non-existing state of affairs. This is what we should have done, or this is what we ought to do, and thus cannot invest a thing with meaning either. An interpretation is required. I'll explain this distinction with the example of chess. Chess can be described as pushing pieces of wood across a board. This is not a very accurate description since it would technically also include checkers or possibly backgammon. A more precise description would mention that the pushing of pieces is in accordance with a set of rules. The bishop, for instance, can go diagonally, the rook vertically and horizontally. But even with this more precise description, we still know little about the game. This is where interpretation is required to invest the game with meaning. In other words, what is the point? I could interpret that the point of chess is to win a game. There are many who would agree with that. I could also interpret that the point of chess is to teach ourselves a variety of intellectual strategies. There are many others who would agree with that statement. To Dworkin, this exemplifies an important difference between describing something and ascribing something with a point or in fact, interpreting it. So on one hand, we have description. The, piece moves, the pieces move across the board. The pieces move across the board according to a set of rules. And on the other hand, we have interpretation. We move these pieces across the board in accord with a series of rules so as to win, so as to help ourselves develop a series of intellectual strategies. In other words, the interpretation is largely about ascribing some type of value to the act. To Dworkin, for interpretive concepts such as law, the distinction between description and interpretation is primarily with the degree of acceptance. The act of interpreting something necessarily involves viewing it in what we regard as a sensible, or perhaps a normal manner. Few are those who would admit that they are interpreting something in a silly or abnormal way. Enter normativity. Dworkin believes that our pursuit of the most sensible or normal interpretation is itself the pursuit of a moral interpretation. Hence why any interpretation in which a description is ascribed a point will also invariably also ascribe a morality. Dworkin breaks down this exercise into three stages. He has what we refer to as the pre-interpretive phase, then we have the interpretive phase, and we have the post-interpretive phase. We'll explore these three phases through an example. Now, it remains common in many parts of the world for a man to open a door for a woman. Rarely do people think about it or even ascribe value to it. They simply do it as there is an implicit rule of courtesy that requires it. As most people regularly engage in the practice, we have effectively accepted this practice as a social norm. To Dworkin, this is merely the pre-interpretive stage, as the practice has not been ascribed a point yet. We move to the interpretive phase when we begin to ask questions about the point of the practice. There is an attitude of questioning, why do we open the door, or why do men open the door for women, and of giving meaning. Men open the door for women because X. This is the first interpretive phase where we ascribe point, where we ascribe meaning. There is, however, a second interpretive phase. The second interpretive phase is where this point will be extended beyond the immediate practice. For instance, using the rule of courtesy about opening doors to infer that women are somehow weaker than men. This is what Dworkin identifies as artistic interpretation. Artistic interpretation is creative interpretation because an individual is interpreting a social practice. They are proposing value for the practice by describing some scheme of interests, some scheme of goals, or even certain principles 
that the practice can be taken to serve or express or exemplify. Now this is distinct from artistic interpretation is distinct from scientific interpretation, which does not involve any interests, goals, or principles. Since, however, interests, goals, and principles will compel reference to some form of morality, Dworkin infers that legal argumentation or legal reasoning ultimately amounts to moral argumentation and moral reasoning. If we can reach a consensus on law then, according to Dworkin, we are implicitly reaching a consensus on the use of force against individuals who disagree with this particular interpretation or morality. A social consensus has been achieved and other people are hereby required to abide by it. When consensus is reached, we enter the post-interpretive phase. To ensure that justice emerges within this seemingly arbitrary mass, we must ensure that interpretations are coherent. This is a key concept for Dworkin, coherence, by which he means that they must express a single and comprehensive view of justice. This view of justice can be liberal, it can be communitarian, it can be anything, but it must be coherent. To recap then, to heart, we obey the law because we accept, perhaps even desire, social stability, while to Dworkin, we obey the law because there is a moral consensus around it.